So we will continue continue our series on anxiety disorders with this lecture entitled Anxiety Disorders 2, where we'll talk about general anxiety disorder, and then we'll talk about the obsessive compulsive spectrum of disorders, which has changed in DSM-5. Previously, it was considered an anxiety disorder. Now it's kind of been pulled out, and it's considered its, its own separate entity. So generalized anxiety disorder. Um, so this is kind of like the general worry that we all get. Um, but taken to a more extreme level where it becomes incapacitating and debil deb debilitating. So symptoms include anxiety, worry about a number of events like family, finances, work, illness for six months. So unlike some other types of disorders, this worry is generally rational. Like it's based in, you know, you really are having problems at work. There really are illnesses. There are really are things to worry about in the family. But it's when the person has trouble controlling that worry. So we all have worries, but it's when that worry kind of takes us over and it then gets associated with restlessness, feeling on edge, getting easily fatigued, problems concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, and problems sleeping. And this needs to occur for six months. So oftentimes you'll see, kind of in terms of clinical presentation, somebody who looks like a, a, a chronic worry wart. <clears throat> But that's not always the case. I mean, um, you have people who this is kind of more their personality, but you also have people who have, you know, stressful situations in their lives that kind of overwhelm them, and this can kind of ensue as a consequence. The majority of their days are feeling spend, feeling tense, highly distractible, irritable, restless, and on edge, causing them to feel fatigued and mildly depressed. Um, generally, the rule of thumb is that you have to be worried more than 50% of the time for six months. So the anxiety is kind of diffuse, unfocused, free-floating, and ongoing. So while there are some realistic worries, that sense then kind of gets out of, like taken out of control. And so there's just general sense of malaise or anxiety or worry that's present. You also can get sweating, dizziness, clammy hands, or tachycardia, which is rapid heart um, beat. So while not a panic attack, you can get some of the symptoms of panic. Um, and so when you have, some people tend to um, somaticize more their symptoms, and so people might think that they have um, some more serious medical problems, but it's often really just the result of the anxiety. So you'll see people kind of going to chiropractors, physiotherapists, nutritionists. Um, and so, you know, some of these things can be helpful to help calm the anxiety, for example, People who have GAD often clench um, and may have get TMG, TMJ um, in their jaw. So things like physiotherapy to help that, and then just working on kind of de-stressing techniques. But it also then impairs your social and occupational functioning because you're more irritable and on edge. You tend to snap at those around you. You have less patience, and you can't focus at work, which makes you less productive. Um, it's about 9% prevalence rate because I think part of it is that we all worry, so a lot of people will not necessarily seek treatment for it. Um, females are more likely than males to have GAD, um, again, in part potentially because of the social um, role socialization for women to worry more than men, and there might be some biological vulnerabilities for women. Um, it's thought that potentially it may be more prevalent among African Americans, but that's not necessarily clear. Usually you'll see an onset in the early 20s or 30s and um, generally has a chronic course and less treated. About one half to one third of individuals remain symptom free after treatment so it responds quite well. Um, and in terms of functional impairment it's kind of almost the equivalent of depression because it's so kind of omnibus and over, overarching that it's kind of like you're functioning in one way, but yet you're not functioning, and so it ha makes it difficult for you because you, you're kind of like the worried well. Um, in terms of comorbidity, they, we do see hybrids of comorbidity with panic attacks or panic disorders, social anxiety disorder, depression, personality disorder, specifically avoidant personality disorder, and the increased level of comorbidities you have, the poorer your functioning and prognosis will be. We don't know very much about the etiology about GAD, and that's partially because it manifests itself differently for different people. Um, it was really a residual category in DSM-3, meaning like anything that didn't fall into the, the aforementioned categories that we had would be generalized anxiety disorder, so it was kind of an NOS. Um, but more recently in the newer, you know, 
versions three, uh, four, and five, we really kind of have shifted the criteria and made it more kind of its own entity in and of itself. And so now that we have more, you know, clear criteria, then we can now have a construct that we can measure and assess. And so we should be seeing more research coming out about it. Um, so the, the criteria from DSM-4 to 5 has remained virtually unchanged. In terms of the etiology or the cause, about a third of it could be due to genetic issues and overlap with temperament. There could be kind of, if you think about the old neuroses that we talked about last time, um, there could be some of that, like the personality disorder, higher levels of behavioral inter inhibition, negative affectivity, kind of glass half empty type of people, and general to general um, tendency to avoid harm. Um, but these all seem to be related to anxiety disorders in general, as we talked about last week, and they're not necessarily specific to, to GAD, so it's unclear what might be the specific trajectory to GAD. The cognitive model of GAD postulates that um, individuals hold negative and positive beliefs about worry that predict um, their worry in their GAD. So people will, will think kind of like worry will help me cope. Um, so, you know, it's it's one thing like uh, I know I do this myself. Sometimes I, I worry more than I need to just because if I worry about the worst that can happen, therefore, if anything less than the worst happens, it's actually a good outcome. And I, But then if the worst happens, then I'm prepared for it. The negative belief is kind of the worry about the worry. So you start to um, worry that, you know, the anxiety is uncontrollable, that you're going to have um, lots of physical and mental consequences about the worry. So you start to have what's called meta-worry, so worry about the worry. And it's, this is something that is specific to GAD. Um, you don't see that in other patients who have different types of anxiety disorders. So in terms of other kind of behavioral factors in, terms, in, the, in the causes or the etiology of the disorder, we see attentional bias towards threats, similar to some of the other anxiety disorders, so they tend to focus on things that may be threatening into their environment. They appraise their ability to cope um, and view danger in a distorted way. So as I kind of mentioned, the t tendency to catastrophize and overestimate fear consequences. I remember... I don't have GAD, but I remember once I couldn't reach my best friend anywhere. I looked for her, and so then I started calling hospitals, which is like obviously over the top, but that way I felt like at least I was doing something. And this catastrophizing may be more specific to GAD. We don't see it as much in other anxiety disorders. Um, there's also the contrast avoidance model, where you have the worry and as I mentioned, which helps the individual prepare for negative events and avoid increased negative emotions should the fear consequence occur. So you, you kind of prepare for the worst. Um, you know, seems to work for me potentially now that I reevaluate it may not be the best coping strategy. There also might be emotion regulation difficulties. So you might see things such as difficulty identifying, differentiating, and describing emotions. Um, and kind of the accepting of effective emotional experiences rather than trying to change them. So in terms of differential diagnoses, so when somebody presents with some of the symptoms of GAD, you want to rule out things such as hyperthyroidism, hypoglycemia, post-concussion syndrome, deliria, alcohol or hypnoanxiolytic withdrawal, caffeine overuse, the use of other stimulants, and other drugs which can mimic many of the symptoms of GAD. Um, we do see a high comorbidity with mood disorders, as we mentioned, about 50%. And that's because when you're worrying like this all the time, you're having these physical co consequences. You're also having problems sleeping, which can then lead to depression. So we also see kind of what's called a mixed depression and anxiety. Um, the second most common diagnosis is panic disorder. And then um, so we also see phobic disorders um, that are comorbid. In terms of management and treatment of GAD, similar to the other anxiety, CBT is actually quite effective. You educate people, you teach them relaxation training skills, which you'll learn if you take my psychotherapy class. Talk about cognitive restructuring, so kind of putting the worry into perspective. I mean, you know, some of these things are realistic worries, but we don't, you don't need to feel worried about them all the time. You kind of do a cost benefit to the worry. You expose them to situations that they're avoiding because of the worry. Um, you know, so like micromanaging, so you kind of have to kind of sit peacefully with chaos and learn to deal with it. 
trying new things. You can also prescribe medication, um, SSRIs such as Lexapro or benzos, but there is a concern, especially with the benzodiazepines, of tolerance withdrawal and dependence. And ultimately, once people get off the medication, the anxiety returns. So it's really as much as possible advocated that people who have anxiety use CBT strategies because then there's kind of an internal locus of control and you feel that when such situations occur in the future that you can handle them. So let's now switch gears and, and talk about obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, this is a very serious disorder and a very debilitating disorder for those that have it. And I hope that you do watch the movie OCD, um, The War Within. It's very powerful and it kind of shows you the suffering that those individuals who have OCD kind of endure. We often make fun of it. Um, there was that movie um, with and, uh, I'm Horrible at Names. Uh, it was about 10, 15 years ago. They won an Academy Award for it. Jack Nicholson was in it, um, where he played an individual with OCD, and it's kind of made light of. Um, there's also a show um, on TV, and I see the main character's name right now. But again, it's kind of done in a mocking way. Um, and so, you know, while we kind of think it's funny, like you can't touch dirt and you have to wash your hands, it really isn't funny for those people who really do experience this. So in terms of history, um, as I mentioned earlier, OCD was listed as an anxiety disorder in DSM-IV, and it's kind of like thought to be kind of a religious melancholy, fear of being guilty, moral, religious, or ethical failure, repressed sexual drives. This is kind of more from a Freudian perspective. And so a lot of these things were kind of like reaction formation or um, overuse of defenses. So you'd see intellectualization, and as I said, reaction formation. However, now um, most experts believe that OCD is not really an anxiety disorder at all, that it's not the result of an anxiety. It's kind of a neurological short circuit of the brain that causes these obsessive thoughts and behaviors. Um, and there are, you know, it's related to other disorders that have these kind of obsessive thoughts and, and repetitive behaviors. So, you know, we were kind of wrong all along in thinking that it may be more an anxiety spectrum. They're now suggesting that it's more kind of has a biological base and a basis for it. So in DSM-5, there's a new category, um, which is considered obsessive compulsive and related disorders. And it reflects the increasing evidence that the disorders are related to one another in terms of range of diagnostic validators. And they're kind of more similar in terms of, of clinical grouping, and we'll go through some of those. So we'll see now in this category of obsessive uh, just compulsive disorders, hoarding disorder, that's when you can't throw anything out, excoriation, which is skin picking, um, substance medication induced OCD, and then OCD and related disorders due to a medical condition. Um, body dysmorphic disorder um, is also kind of now falling under here. So it's a preoccupation with one or more perceived deficits or flaws in physical appearance. It's not observable or appear slight to other people, as well as repetitive behaviors that go along with it, like mirror checking or mental acts, like comparing their, their appearance to that of other people. So body dysmorphic disorder is something that you'll see often in people who um, end up going to plastic surgery clinics very frequently. Um, these are people who have these almost imagined um, deficits, I guess, or like they feel like, you know, we all have those times where we look in the mirror and we focus on our negative features. That's normal. People with BDD, they take that to a whole new level. That's all they see of themselves and they can't see otherwise. Like even if we have a pimple, for example, and you focus on that pimple, you probably notice that pimple more than other people notice that pimple. That pimple is noticeable. Somebody who has BDD would focus on something that isn't even necessarily noticeable to other people. It was hypothesized that Michael Jackson might have body dysmorphic disorder, but um, that's never been officially diagnosed. Hoarding disorder is those um, shows that we see on TV. And again, it's almost done in jest, like kind of like look at these freaks. But it's a very serious and debilitating disorder because people with hoarding disorder have difficulty discarding or parting with possessions because of the need to save and accumulate possessions. 
because they feel like if they throw something out, then they may need it at some point in time. And even if you try to throw something out for them, they endure it with great distress. But they, their houses become so cluttered uh, that they become unlivable and they have infestations of animals and there could be fire hazards. And so um, it really causes significant impairment in their ability, ability to function. Trichotillomania is repeated hair pulling. Um, despite repeated attempts to stop doing that. So you'll see oftentimes people will have no eyelashes, eyebrows, or have bald spots in their heads. Um, you know, some people are more sophisticated in that they'll do it um, such that it's not noticeable. So they'll do it underneath their hair um, so they can, you know, their, their, their bald spots kind of that are hidden throughout their head, but they're not necessarily noticeable if people's hair is down. And excoriation disorder is skin picking. Um, and again, this is above and beyond kind of the normal stuff that we all pick on ourselves, but this is, you know, people do it and it's kind of, it produces kind of a release of anxiety. So in terms of, you know, symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorders, people who have OCD have um, persistent obsessions, which are disturbing and intrusive. Um, and then they have these impulses, which they have to do as a consequence of the obsessions. Um, and then they, they find them illogical, but they have to do them. They, you know, you ask them why they're doing it, they don't know, but if they don't do it, it generates tremendous anxiety. So compulsions are the repeated um, behaviors or mental acts that are attempts to neutralize these obsessions. So by doing, you know, for example, people who hand wash often feel like they're being contaminated and by hand washing a certain number of times, they are able to neutralize the contamination. Um, true obsessions and compulsions are the essential traits of obsessive compulsive disorder um, and it's surprisingly common and about 3% of the population will have it. So obsessions make appear as ideas, words, rhymes, melodies um, and they're usually they, they interrupt thoughts. They're generally nonsensical, obscene or blasphemous um, so it may be, you know, somebody who is religious may have themes like, you know, uh, negative cognitions about Jesus or God or things like that. Um, they sometimes may even be unusually violent or disgusting, such as a mother wanting to kill her child, even though obviously under no circumstance would she want to do that, or to, you know, take a knife and stab somebody, even though that's not something the person would ever do. Um, Almost all patients with OCD have obsessions, so the obsessions obviously are mental, so they're not as obvious, and a majority of them have compulsive rituals based on the obsessions, although not all. The compulsive rituals are often directly linked to the obsession by magical thinking. So if I do, I can prevent whatever bad thing I'm obsessing about by doing X. And so one of the treatments, as we'll talk about, is preventing people from doing X and having them recognize that whatever they, their worst fear actually doesn't happen. So underlying most cases of OCD is some sort of inflated responsibility or overestimation of threat. So something bad is going to happen unless I do this. So people might believe that they, you know, if they don't wash their hands repeatedly, they might get HIV, even though the medical um, evidence is to the contrary. And so any possibility of something bad happening elevates the probability and this near certainty that it will happen. They also have other dysfunctional beliefs that kind of include perfectionism and tolerance of uncertainty. So that's why you see like kind of the winding up of things. Oftentimes kind of there needs to be order and rigidity and you often see um, exaggeration of important thoughts and the need to control thoughts. So generally, most forms of OCD fall into the following categories. You see the, the washers that fear contamination, and they usually also have cleaning compulsions. Um, you can tell this often by looking at people's hands. They'll be red and raw, and sometimes bleeding and dry. Checkers repeatedly check things like ovens being turned off, doors locked, etc. Um, now, we all do this to a certain extent. It's not uncommon, and this is where people think they have OCD and they don't. We all check things a few times. People who have OCD often spend more than two hours a day in checking behavior. So that's kind of the clinical threshold. It's not going back to check your oven once or twice. It's going back to check your oven like 10 times, taking a picture of it and then still going back to check it, that it's off. Doubters and sinners feel terrible things will happen. If everything is not perfect, they're more likely to be paralyzed into inaction than have compulsions. 
Um, and you also see counters and arrangers, and they're ruled by magical thinking. And so they have these rituals where they have to have things arranged. <clears throat> In terms of clinical course, about two-thirds of patients with OCD have substantial symptoms before the age of 15. And almost all of them have some substantial symptoms in childhood, which leads to more of a biological basis for these behaviors. Men generally develop OCD earlier than women, um, with the mean age of onset about 20. Usually the first psychiatric contact is around age 27. And uh, if there is to be a hospitalization, it happens in the, third, in the 30s. At some point, people um, become paralyzed or they can't function anymore, at which point they may need hospitalization. It can be gradual in onset, although it can increase in severity with um, psychosocial stressors. And for the average patient, it's generally chronic throughout their lifetime with periods of waxing and waning. So some of the complications in comorbidity, um, anytime that you try to resist an obsession or compulsion, it may produce tremendous anxiety or panic. And so this is very aversive. Um, you, it's very comorbid with depression and other anxiety disorders because it's very hard for individuals to lead normal lives because, for example, if you fear contamination, having somebody else in your environment um, may be very difficult for you. It's hard to sustain interpersonal relationships when you're doing kind of behaviors that you can't even explain to yourself. How is somebody else going to sustain those? Um, there's a lot of suicidal thinking, however, Less than 1% of these individuals actually go on to commit suicide. You'll see in the movie that that is not uncommon. And several uncommon disorders may coexist with OCD, um, but they're not necessarily a result of it. So we'll see eating disorders, trichotillomania, and tic disorders, which may suggest some sort of biological comorbidity. Um, we also see sometimes body dysmorphic disorder with OCD, which is why they now felt that this is a new grouping of behaviors. In terms of epidemiology, lifetime prevalence, we mentioned about 3%. Sexes are equally affected with men kind of having it earlier than um, women. We see it more commonly among higher educated, higher SES groups and those with higher IQs. That could be that those are the people that are seeking treatment. Um, it's not particularly um, o OCPD, so obsessive compulsive personality disorder, is not particularly more common in OCD than other anxiety disorders. But we do see more avoidant and depressive, I um, mean, sorry, and dependent personality disorders in those with OCD. In terms of um, etiology, there is some suggestion that there are structural abnormalities in the frontal lobes, basal ganglia, <clears throat> anterior cingular cortex, cingular cortex in the limbic system. So we see um, that the basal ganglia is involved in overlearning. So that's where we can kind of see things. Um, such as the, the behavioral manifestations of these OCDs. The um, ACC is involved in cognitive control in the prefrontal, prefrontal areas, um, sorry, um, are then involved in planning and organizing behaviors of the frontal cortex. And so um, you can kind of sever connections between the limbic system and frontal lobes in the severe cases, but this would really um, be an extreme case. In most cases, you can have exposure and response prevention to help treat some of these disorders. Um, it is possible that there is serotonin involved in this because the medications that have been used to treat OCD are ser um, that, that work are, are serotonin-based, but you know, we haven't had conclusive evidence based on this, and so we're not necessarily finding different levels of serotonin between those with OCD and normal controls. We do see that it runs in families, um, and we see concordance rates for are 70% for monozygotic and 50% for dizygotic twins, which suggests some sort of genetic transmission. Um, <clears throat> somebody who has OCD has about one quarter or 25% chance of having a first degree relative with this disorder, which suggests there's a more significant biological basis than many of the other disorders that we, um, in the anxiety spectrum. So we have to, in terms of differential diagnosis, we want to, you know, check to see that these are not normal obsessions and compulsions that we all have to a certain extent. Um, those who have OCPD don't really have true obsessions and compulsions. It's more kind of just like they, they're kind of like Monica and friends where they like order and rules, but they're not, they don't have what, what we just described as these obsessions or compulsions that they can't explain. 
Compulsive gambling, eating, and sexual behaviors are not true compulsions. It's not the same thing as OCD. Um, the person usually enjoys doing them and they don't imagine disaster occurring if they're not done. So these are more issues of control than um, compulsions as we've just talked about before. Schizophrenic delusions also may resemble obsessions in that they're, they're irrational, but they're usually um, egotonic in, in the sense that they don't necessarily cause distress and they occur um, without the patient's insight. So there's usually you know, not a large degree of insight. Usually patients with OCD accept the fact that their obsessions are not realistic. And people who have major depression also can have these ruminative guilt-ridden um, critical obsessions. And so you have to kind of look at the whole gestalt of it and the other symptoms that are presenting and whether it's really more related to negative self-appraisal, which we'll see kind of in, um, in those with OCD. So in terms of medication, we'll see that people who are medicated stay on it chronically about the 85% relapse about a month or two after stopping medication. Um, behavior therapy, so um, exposure and response prevention are recommended for compulsions. And in extreme cases, you can have the cingulotomy with the surgery.